Welcome to Bristol Ideas. I'm Andrew Kelly, Director of Festival of Ideas. Today we're talking with Luke Maniad. Luke is Lee Simpkins, Family Professor of Arts and Sciences, and Anne T. and Robert M. Bass, Professor of English at Harvard, a staff writer at The New Yorker, and was a contributing editor of the New York Review of Books, 1994 to 2001. He has published many important books, including The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America, and now The Free World, Art and Thought in the Cold War. He was awarded the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for History, and in 2016, the National Humanities Medal by President Obama. This is a terrific book, not only in telling the remarkable story of a remarkable time, but also providing much to think about in terms of the themes discussed in the book and the nature of creativity today. I hope we'll have a chance to speak about some of these issues, but can we start with you, Luke? You grew up in this period, didn't you? I did, but you know, I was a little kid. So uh, the book covers the period 1945 to 1965. And I think most of the figures I write about, I heard about when I was growing up, but I didn't know the first thing about them really. So it was a way to kind of revisit that period of my life and really flesh out, you know, my knowledge of the time. So that was, it was fun. That was fun. That was a fun part of writing the book for me. Take us back then to 1945. America's emerging victorious from the Second World War. And this huge shift happens, doesn't it, in, in, in world politics, but also in culture. Yeah, you know, America has had a tradition of isolationism. Um, but after 1945, the country was very engaged with the rest of the world to a great degree, um, both in terms of providing foreign aid, helping to rebuild Western Europe, helping to rebuild Japan, creating military treaties, um, but just generally taking the lead in the Cold War, that is to say the struggle against communism. Um, so the country suddenly takes center stage uh, in 1945 when the war ends because we had helped to lead the fight against fascism um, and then we had been playing this active role in world affairs. So the country had a lot of political capital in those years right after the war. It didn't have a lot of cultural capital because I think most people regarded the United States as a peripheral player in global culture, certainly of sort of the fine arts and literature and so on. People liked American jazz and they liked Hollywood movies, but they didn't really take America seriously culturally. And that's something that changes after 1945. And that's really the story my book tells of how by 1965, we had acquired a reputation as a center of cultural production and circulation and distribution, not just of American art, but art from people around the world. And at the same time, we burned through that political capital that we'd accumulated during the war. So that's basically the story the book tries to tell. Now you cover many themes and many individuals and many yeah. groups and publications and so on in this book. And I'm going to take you through some of them because I think that's one of the best ways of illuminating some of the ideas uh, that you have. Now, a number of these people are, are ones that generally are not well known nowadays. Um, and I wanted to start with one who was, I read a lot about when I was younger um, and read his work, but George Kennan, who kind of bookends your, your book, doesn't he? Yeah, George Kennan begins the book and, and then he shows up at the very end. Uh, so just to explain that 1965 was picked as the end point by me for the book because that's the year that United States sends troops to South Vietnam. That's when we get militarily engaged in that war. Um, so it starts with Kennan because Kennan was an American diplomat um, who was serving in the American embassy in Moscow after the war. And in 1946, uh, the State Department, American State Department, wrote to the embassy and asked if someone could explain Stalin's intentions. So you remember that for three the last three years of the Second World War, Stalin was the ally of the UK and the US in the fight against uh, Germany. Um, and indeed, I don't think we could have won the war without the Red Army um, pushing back the Nazis into Germany and finally destroying the Nazi state. And so Stalin in that period was a partner with the UK and the US. 
Um, but after the war, he started behaving very strangely, and people in the American government just weren't sure how to read his intentions, whether he was planning to be cooperative with uh, other countries in post-war affairs, or whether he was only interested in the Russian national interests, um, and you know, and was a dictator, uh, somebody who was just not compatible with the ideals of liberal democracy. So Kennan um, believed the latter. That, Kennan, that Stalin was someone the US and the UK and France could not trust, um, and that he was only interested in his own uh, national interest and in, in, in ex possibly expanding the boundaries of Soviet influence. So uh, Kennan gets this request. He writes a telegram to the State Department, which is known as the long telegram because it's the longest telegram in the history of American diplomacy, 6,000 words. He dictates it. He's in bed. He's got a fever, which is very difficult. He dictates it. Uh, and, and in that, he spells out what's called the policy of containment. The policy of containment is basically let's keep the communists in their box. So whatever goes on <clears throat> inside the box in the Soviet Union is none of our business. Uh, they can abuse human rights all they want in their own country. The only thing we should be concerned about is if they tend, if they attempt to expand their influence or their territorial reach, and then we have to push back. So that's containment. We contain communism. Kenneth thought if we were patient in doing that, we didn't need to drop the bomb on the Soviet Union because communism would destroy itself of its own inefficiency. And that was basically the American policy. Rhetorically, people talked about liberation and so forth, but actually the American policy was not to intervene inside the Iron Curtain. So when there was a revolution in Hungary in 1956, the United States didn't do anything about it because that was their business. Only thing we were worried about is, they, is any kind of expansion beyond the Iron Curtain into Western Europe and elsewhere in the world. So there's a crisis of this policy in 1965, which is Vietnam. So George Kennan, who's now retired from government, is called to testify before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in Congress. And he's asked, 1966, was this what you intended by the doctrine of by the policy of containment that the United States would have to send troops to prevent North Vietnam from invading South Vietnam. He couldn't answer the question. It's a very hard question to answer because if your policy is to keep them in the box and they're trying to expand militarily, you just can't send Louis Armstrong on a goodwill tour to South Vietnam. You have to send the Marines, which is what we were doing. So, so that's how the book ends. So, so he's the bookend of the story. Now, the, the most important word in the book is, of course, is, is freedom and the free world. And this was not just freedom from conflict and so on, but it was a very positive form of freedom, wasn't it, in terms of creativity and the, the creation of new work. Um, but you, you go through many people and you talk about um, many examples of this. And I wanted to draw some of that. And the first one I wanted to draw on was the kind of himself and the group around him of, of George Orwell and how people dealt with the concept of totalitarianism. Yeah. I mean, Orwell, there's no more key figure in this period than Orwell and Orwell's book, 1984, <clears throat> was published in 1949. Um, I'm sure all your listeners know the book well. Um, it sold 2 million copies in the first five years of the Cold War. And then it has an interesting history of <clears throat> becoming popular again, 1989, and then at 2016, when Trump was elected, people started reading it again. So he's just a very important figure. And I think a lot of people's ideas about totalitarianism come from that book, which is, of course, a work of fiction. Um, I think there's often some misunderstanding of what Orwell's intention was in writing 1984. Um, his intention was not to satirize Soviet communism, because he'd already done that in Animal Farm. His intention was to describe a possible future for the entire world. Can, uh, Orwell was worried that modern history is developing in a direction where the only way to govern mass societies is totalitarian states. And they'll arise all around the world and they'll become these big kind of behemoths and they'll dominate everybody's lives. And remember in 1984, there's three of them, these three super states, East Asia, Eurasia, and Oceania. Uh, and they're constantly engaged in a kind of Cold War struggle with one another. Um, and they, they uh, maintain that by a system of propaganda and brainwashing and oppression and so forth. Um, so it wasn't that he was thinking this is the communist future. He was thinking this is the Cold War. Mm -hmm. The Cold War will be like this. These two monster superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States, will dominate the world, and they'll just have this interminable and unwinnable war with one another. Um, he actually wrote an article right before he started writing 1984 saying that 
among possible alternative futures after 1945, the one he preferred was that we bomb each other into the Stone Age and start all over again. What he didn't want was a Cold War. And yet his book became, for lots of people, a rationale for having a Cold War. If we don't, do the, if we don't have a Cold War, this is what will happen. Uh, obviously, there was a, a, this flowering of culture, um, which, and there was also things that allowed that, you know, the gradual reduction of censorship, yeah. um, tastes becoming more Catholic, and many, many reasons for this. I want to ask you just about a few people to, to illustrate this. The first one I want to ask you about was John Cage and, yeah. the, and the breakthroughs that he, that he had. Yeah. So just to your first, yeah, I talk about Cage. So the, so the first point, that, so what you see in these 20 years is a gradual opening up of the reduction of censorship, changes in obscenity law, which are very strict both in the UK and the US, as you know, um, uh, and the general uh, uh, interest in all kinds of cultural productions, high and low, and so on. So it takes a while for this, for this all to develop. But one way to think about why that happens when this happens is because of geopolitics. Because if the United States and the liberal democracies are, stand, are standing for freedom of expression, they have to prove it by getting rid of restrictions and constraints on what people can do. So if you have obscenity laws that are very uh, constraining as they were, that's an inhibition on people's ability to express themselves. So if you're standing for freedom of expression, then you have to change those laws. So a lot of the changes are actually driven by the need of particularly the United States to, to, to live up to its values, to live up to its own propaganda. So you see freedom as a general sort of value in this period, partly because that's the motto of the, free, of the liberal democracies. So John Cage is a great figure uh, to write about. I, of course, I knew a little bit of, he's an avant-garde composer. I knew a little bit about him because he, as he was kind of a zany genius kind of figure, but I didn't really understand what his work was about until I started writing uh, about him in the book. And it turns out that, turned out, I didn't know this, that he was really a major figure through this whole period, really into the 1960s, for, not just for musicians, which is what he was, but for choreographers and for painters and so on, because he represented the real avant-garde. He was willing to go where nobody else was willing to go. And probably the example that all your listeners know about is the so-called silent piece for piano, which is the real title is four minutes and 33 seconds, which is how long the piece lasts. Um, and it was, he, he composed it in 1952. Um, so from one point of view, that just looks like a kind of Dada piece of anti-art, but that's not at all what Cage had in mind when he composed that. Um, it actually, it's a tradi very traditional aesthetic experience. It's just that you're not used to having that experience, but that's what he wants you to have. I can explain how that's supposed to work in a second. But so what Cage wanted to do, just in terms of your question about freedom, was to free up sounds and silences as equivalent to musical notes. So when you listen to a piece of music, you're listening to musical tones. But there's also other stuff going on in the room while you're listening, ambient sound. And there's also silence when you take the, you know, when you turn the machine off or stop listening to it. So Cage wanted people to think about noise, silence, and musical sounds as all equivalent. He wanted to free noise to be part of music, and he wanted to free silence. So the silent piece is just pure silence, but you're supposed to experience it as music. Because what you're listening to when you're not listening to the piano or the, whatever instrument it is that's not being played is all the ambient sound. Suddenly you realize there's all this stuff going on around you in the oral environment that you're not paying attention to. And Cage wanted to get people to pay attention to that. It's, it's interesting. You're not, you don't think it's interesting, but if you pay, forced to pay attention to it, you realize it is, it is interesting. The second person I wanted to talk about was James Baldwin, who um, was obviously a, a pivotal figure during this time on, on many issues, but particularly on race and segregation and yeah. civil rights. Um, how does he, and, and he was, you know, someone who was both a, 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 a fan of the United States, if I could say that, but also quite alienated from the place. Yeah, yeah. he was. That's a good way to put it. Um, Baldwin, one interesting part of Baldwin's career that, um, that you have to take into account is that he lived for nine years in Paris. So he, he, he went to Paris in 1948. He, I think he was about 24 years old. And he, because he didn't, because he was unhappy with the racism and segregation in American life, also homophobia, which he'd experienced, mm -hmm. and he just wanted to get out. 
So he went to Paris, which is where actually a lot, quite a number of American blacks went, including Richard Wright, the novelist, black novelist, who also moved to Paris after the war. Um, and he's, he moved there in 1948, and he came back to the United States not until 1957. So what's significant about that is that the big story in this whole period is not really the Cold War. The big story is decolonization. Because that changed the inter that changed the international map. I mean, that just that changed everything. Um, all these European empires, the peak of which was 1939. That's when Europe, European countries had the big biggest domination of the planet. All disappear after 1945, pretty much. Um, that's an enormous change in world history. So France is very involved in that because, of course, France had a colonial empire, and it lost two colonies in wars. One, of course, Indochina. Um, which became the war in Vietnam, and then the second in Algeria. So this is all happening in the 50s when Baldwin's in Paris, and he's, so he's listening to all these conversations about decolonization, about these new non-white states that are governed by non-whites for the first time in modern history. And, he, and he's listening to people compare that situation with the American civil rights movement. And Baldwin took the position that the American civil rights movement is not really related to these decolonizing states in West Africa and Caribbean and so on, um, Southeast Asia, because the black American black experience is different from the experience of a colonized subject in one of those uh, European colonies. And so he gets into arguments with people in, in, in France about that. And then when he comes back to the United States in 57, that's sort of the beginning of the American civil rights movement that led by Martin Luther King Jr. He makes friends with King, he really admires King, um, and he becomes kind of a spokesman for the civil rights movement. Then in 1963, which is kind of the peak of the movement, but King gives the I Have a Dream speech and so on, he publishes a book called The Fire Next Time, which is about American race relations, which becomes a big bestseller. He becomes this very important figure. And, and it links nicely to the question I had next, which is about Paris, because one of the points you make is that this, you're not just talking solely about American no. cultural production. You're talking about the production of the free world, as it were. And you and you write a lot about, particularly about Simone de Beauvoir um, and about Jean-Paul Sartre, don't you? I do. I talk about both of them, particularly Beauvoir. I mean, uh, but yeah, they're very. They come on the scene right after the war, in 1945, um, and existentialism just sort of takes off kind of floods the cultural field in, in France, then the US, to some extent in the UK, there's more resistance to it there. Um, but you know, it becomes kind of a fad and you know, they become these kind of iconic figures. Uh, Beauvoir is also important because she publishes in that same period, 1948, The Second Sex, a very important book for the women's movement uh, of the 1960s. Uh, so I do talk quite a bit about them. But to your larger point, yeah, I found there's just a lot of French people in this story. I, yeah. well, I didn't intend it for it to be that way, but they're just really important figures. And there's sort of a kind of conventional notion that after 1945, the kind of capital of culture moves to New York, but it doesn't happen that fast. Everybody's still going to Paris. All these American painters go to Paris after the war and try to study there. And American writers go there. Um, a lot of American literature gets written in Paris uh, after 1945. So Paris is still central. And certainly Parisian intellectuals like Claude Lévi-Strauss or Jacques Derrida, very influential on American thought. So there's a tendency of American historians to be very US centric, to say the least, and to forget stuff is going on in the rest of the world. Like Americans write about the American civil rights movement as though it has nothing to do with decolonization, but that's not how the rest of the world saw it. They saw those things as connected. So I try to show those connections. I try to show that the free world is all these countries contributing to this period of incredible cultural change. And, and the book, you know, what I loved about the book was those connections you kept making, you know, whether it was on an individual, you start with an individual person and it broadens out or indeed thematic connections and actual country to country connections as well. Yeah, yeah, there's just a lot of it. I mean, for example, just to take a, a, a UK example, the British pop art, which yeah. way precedes American pop art, uh, begins around 1952. Uh, with artists like Eduardo Polozzi and uh, Richard Hamilton and Rainer Banham, who's a critic, and Lawrence Holloway, who's a critic, you know, they formulate sort of the philosophy of pop art long before anybody else does, because of because of all these American goods that are coming into 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 England, um, American magazines in particular, advertising stuff like that. Um, so so that's that's a case where 
you know, there's a response to American culture in Europe first before the Americans start doing that same kind of art. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff. Then, of course, the you know famous example of the influence of rock and roll on uh, on British pop, and then the arrival of the Beatles in 1964 to the United States, which really transforms American music. Just a couple of other people I just want to talk about because I think they're they're very important to you. The, the first is about Isaiah Berlin, and you know who who thought a lot about issues of, of liberty throughout his whole life. Yeah. Yeah, Berlin uh, wrote an essay that called Two Concepts of Liberty in 1958. <clears throat> he was a he was a Russian uh, emigre. Uh, he, I think his family came here when he was 11 years old, <clears throat> and he maintained his Russian. Also, of course, <laughs> also knew English rather really well. And he gave this lecture in 1958 called Two Concepts of Liberty, which was published as a little book. And I think that's a very influential statement. Um, and not to go through all the details of it, but basically what it boils down to is that equality <clears throat> and liberty are incommensurable ends. In order to have more equality, you have to give up some liberty and vice versa. Um, and that it's a mistake to think that uh, we could have a utopia in which everybody is equal and also everybody is equally free. Um, and so that's an important ingredient in what I call, what I would describe as American liberal anti-communism. Um, and so there's a lot of American thinkers to sort of think that way. They're anti-utopian because they realize you have to make sacrifices to get the goods that you want. Those could be other goods that you might want as well. So, that, so that's an influential uh, argument. Um, and I think it, so what that, what that represents therefore is that the values of liberal democracy, which would be the values of freedom, are ultimately, I mean, at some point, incompatible with the values of socialism, which, are the value, which is the value of equality. So that's what he's describing. Now, in Berlin's case, he's quite clear he prefers liberty to equality. He's quite clear that if you force people to be what they don't want to be, even if it's good for them, like equal, uh, you're taking away their liberty. You can't justify it in terms of some higher end. Um, and so that's the position that he took. And then the final, I mean, there's so many people I'd like to talk about, the, the, and we just have the time, but the final one I want to talk about is Susan Sontag, um, yeah. because she, you know, was someone who, again, very, very influential when I was a student, for example. Um, and, um, and I, but I learned a lot more from her, actually, about her from, from your book. Yeah. Particularly her relationship with politics as she moved through her writing. Yeah. So um, Susan Sontag was a, was a formidable intellectual. She was trained at University of Chicago, Harvard, and Oxford. Um, she knew the Western musical canon. She's a big fan of Stravinsky, uh, Mozart, and so on. She knew continental philosophy. Uh, she knew the movies. She knew avant-garde fiction. I mean, she, she was really a formidable figure. And she comes on the scene in the early 1960s in New York. Um, and her work, that she, essays that she wrote, which get collected in a book called Against Interpretation in 1965, which is sort of her big first book, they're very apolitical. So she's very interested in what we would call art for art's sake. She's interested in formal experimentation. She's interested in pushing the boundaries of what you can do in the novel and what you can do in painting and so forth. Um, she's, and she's, and, and she's, she's extremely apolitical to the point that she defends the Nazi films of Lenny Riefenstahl on grounds that we could just bracket the ideology. We can admire them as cinema. So this is, so when she publishes 19, uh, this book in 1965, that's the position that she's taking. Um, and then Vietnam happens and she becomes political overnight. <laughs> and then the, all the rest of her career is about politics. And she actually doesn't want to talk about these early essays, even though they're quite, quite famous, like Notes on Camp. Um, so, so, that, so the other part of it that's interesting about Sontag is that in the essay called Against Interpretation, which is the title essay of the volume, she calls for what she calls, she calls for an erotics of interpretation. So what does that mean? I think what it meant was that she wanted people not to respond to art intellectually, not to try to figure it out, but to respond to it sort of in a sensory way, to enjoy it aesthetically without intellectualizing it or making kind of a, kind of a cerebral response to it. Um, and that was a way of opening up the audience for popular culture because when you listen to the Supremes or the Beatles or you watch you know popular movies, 
you don't intellectualize that experience. You enjoy that experience for what the aesthetic properties of it are. You don't expect more from it than it can give, but you also don't look down on it. So what's interesting about all of that is Susan Seidig herself was a complete snob who didn't own a television set, probably did listen to the Beatles. She just could see this is the way things were going, and she started, she, so, she, so she calls for this arise of interpretation. And she caught exactly, which is something she's really good at, exactly what was happening in the cultural moment of 1964-1965. She got it, um, and she was able to express it and became this important critic that you, that you read. I would you, you set all this in the context, the big context of freedom and the Cold War and so on. But there's also a context about cultural exhibition, cultural reception and so on. And you, you devote quite a lot of really yeah. important space, I think, to the growth of galleries, the, yeah. the growth of paperback publishing, for example, yeah. and also the role of critics, which I thought came across as, as very important in terms of uh, uh, in this period uh, that you're yes. talking about. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. That's so it's a very important part of the book for me is describing the growth of these cultural infrastructures. Yeah. So, so when Jackson Pollock, for example, who was leading abstract expressionist painter in the late 1940s, there were not a lot of art galleries in the United States that sold contemporary American painting. It's just people who bought art bought European art, and they usually bought old European art. Um, so if you were a contemporary American painter in 1947 or 1948, there just were not a lot of places where you could get your stuff exhibited where people could come in and buy it or museums could come in and collect it. Um, that changes. That's one of the things that changes in this period. But by 1962, when pop art burst onto the scene, there's lots of art galleries that show contemporary American art. So the pop artists have in, instant entree into the art world that was much harder for people painters in an earlier era. Say the true of book publishing because of the paperback revolution that you just mentioned. Say the true of the music industry, which grows enormously because transistor radios, car radios, jukeboxes, all these new technological devices to deliver music to people start coming into being and it spreads music more widely. People want to buy more recordings, people want to buy record players, and then the whole music industry grows. Museum attendance uh, skyrockets. Uh, university attendance skyrockets. Um, there's this enormous growth in the cultural cultural world uh, that creates an infrastructure, an institutional infrastructure of, in the case of art dealers, collectors, critics, you know, gallerists, and so on, and the educated public for this new kind of art. And that it couldn't happen without those things. So it's important for me in the book to try to explain how it was possible for this stuff to get out to the public uh, because these industries kept growing. And I thought that also. The, it, you know, they weren't the biggest sellers of, of those compared to, say, some of the other things you talked about. But the, 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 the role of kind of political journals of the time, the, the ramparts and the, um, uh, the, the ones that Dwight MacDonald edited, politics and so on, yeah. were, were, were very important, weren't they, in terms of the intellectual climate? They were. You know, the, so as you mentioned, the circulation is going to be quite small. Partisan Review, probably the most famous of the American periodicals. I think never had a circulation higher than about 8,000 mm -hmm. in that period, but they were 8,000 really important people. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's an intellectual discussion world that takes place in these non-academic journals. Um, and those really tend to disappear after the 1970s in the US because the university just absorbs all that stuff. But in the 1930s and on, uh, 40s and 50s, people who were sort of radical intellectuals, uh, didn't have a place in universities, so they so they gravitated to these little journals, and they produced. Their, I mean, the journals are. If you look at old issues of partisan reviews, it's unbelievable the people who are being published in them. Very really important writers, almost none of whom are academics. Um, so so that becomes a center of political discussion and also cultural discussion. And then you mentioned earlier the role that criticism plays. So it's just not true today. Uh, what was true in the '60s and '50s, which is the critic was a kind of policeman, you know, who could tell people it's okay to like this, it's, you shouldn't like that, um, because people were very insecure, particularly here in the U.S., very insecure about whether they should like the Beatles or whether they should like abstract painting or whatever. And critics came along and explained why you should like it and why you shouldn't like that. Um, so they play a super important role. And again, that role is largely exercised through these little magazines. Now, the final little case I just wanted to ask you about was, was one of the big breakthroughs, and this was in the movies, and involved a lot of critic involvement and so on, was um, Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, so the Bonnie and Clyde story is a great 
story. If we have a minute, I'll try to explain it quickly. Uh, um, and, and it goes all the way back to the war. Um, of course, during the German occupation, you couldn't see American movies in France. Um, so when uh, the Germans left in 1945, uh, were defeated, um, there were about 2,000 American movies that had been made in Hollywood that had never been seen in occupied Europe. Um, so the United States entered into an agreement in 1946 with the French to loan them money, this is before the Marshall Plan, uh, to loan them money to rebuild. And part of that agreement, the French agreed to lower their quotas for foreign movies to be shown in France. The French had a quota system to protect their own industry. So the United States basically forced France to open up its screens to American movies. So in 1946, when this goes into effect, all these American movies that had gotten made during the war come to Paris. Citizen Kane, Maltese Falcon, Casablanca, you know, a, lot of, a lot of film noir, a lot of pretty famous American films that had never been seen in France all come all at once. And they're fascinating to a group of young cineasts in France who go to these film clubs and watch these American movies, including Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut, and the sort of father figure of both of them, the critic Andre Bazin who was a kind of champion of American film. And Cahiers du Cinéma, the French film journal, comes into being around this time, 1953, I think, and it champions American poop, Hollywood movies. It's American films, are, they're, they're real cinema, these are great directors, da 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 um, So these young would-be directors like Godard and Truffaut are watching these American movies, they're writing about them in the pages of Cahiers du Cinéma, they were both film critics. Um, and then when they finally get a chance to make their own movies at the end of the decade, 1960, 1959, uh, they try to make American movies. So Godard's first movie is Breathless, made in 1960, and he's trying to make basically an American crime couple movie. So the crime couple genre is an old genre in which these two people get together, a man and a woman, and they go on a crime spree. And then so one of them kills a cop, and then, and then they're basically doomed by the end of the movie because they get chased down and killed. Um, so Godard tried to make that story with Breathless, um, and uh, he finished in 1960. Um, and it's filled with allusions to American movies. If, you, if you've ever watched the movie, it's all kind of references to Humphrey Bogart and if, sort of movies, American movies of the 1950s and so on. It's saturated with that because Godard's thinking about it as kind of an American movie. Of course, from an American point of view, there's no movie that's more French than Breathless. It seems completely French. So Breathless comes here in 1961. Um, it's exhibited in the, here in the United States, it's exhibited in the United States. And young filmmakers in the United States see it and they hear, oh, I want to make a movie like that. So two of those filmmakers were the screenwriters, Robert Benton and David Newman, and they write the screenplay for Bonnie and Clyde, uh, which is a crime couple story, just like Breathless. And they try to get Truffaut to direct it. So Truffaut flies to New York and he meets with them and looks at the script and they talk about it. And he says he can't do it. His English is terrible, and da, da 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 da. But he suggests that they ask Godard. So they ask Godard, and Godard flies to New York, and they show it to Godard, and he sort of has has, has kind of crazy reaction the way he would. Uh, and they end up, he ends up being directed by an American director named Arthur Penn, who was a big infatuate, infatuated with the French New Wave the movies of Truffaut and Godard. Um, so they tried to make a French New Wave movie in America, and the movie was Bonnie and Clyde. And no movie is more American than Bonnie and Clyde. So it's a great example of how this transnational, we talked about a little bit earlier, some other cases earlier, how this transnational uh, exchange produces all kinds of new things that were completely unpredictable uh, by people kind of misunderstanding or misreading what the cultural product of the other group was. Uh, and that's just a particularly vivid example of it. And then when Bonnie and Clyde comes out here in 1967, it inaugurates what's called the Hollywood New Wave, in which all these young directors start making movies that are much more sophisticated than the Hollywood product had been. So that started by the French New Wave, which was also started by American movies. It's an example, a fine example of all those connections you talk about in the book, really. And of course, it was, I mean, I watched Bonnie and Clyde again recently, and it still is incredibly violent as a film, actually, and, and how it was received then. It was way, it was extremely violent when it was received in 1967, because Hollywood was very constrained by what's called the production code which was adopted in the 1930s, which the Hollywood studios agreed not to show certain things that would be disturbing. Many of those things having to do with sex, but some of them having to do with violence. And, and the production code sort of was in abeyance in 1966, 1967, when they made Bonnie and Clyde, and they took oppor the opportunity to show 
scenes of bloodshed and killing much more graphically than they could have done if the code had still been in effect. It was kind of a window for that opportunity. And I remember, I saw it in 1967, I was 15 years old. I just was stunned when I left the movie theater because the whole ending is this incredibly gory uh, massacre of Bonnie and Clyde on this kind of gun ambush. Uh, and I just thought, I've never, I've never seen anything like that before. And I hadn't, because it wasn't possible to do that in Hollywood movies. Now, just to finally to talk about today and, and any lessons for today, really, because the, the as we talked about earlier, there, there were many contextual things behind this, you know, that you talk about in the book. There's the war, of course, but also the wealth gap wasn't as large. You had the growth of feminism at the time, um, the first wave of feminism, rather. Um, and I just wanted to read out a little bit from the, the start of the book, where you talk about these, about changing laws on race, about housing um, issues and so on. He said, as conditions changed, so did arts and ideas. The expansion of the university, of book publishing, of the music business and of the art world, along with new technologies of reproduction and distribution, speeded up the rate of innovation. Most striking was the nature of the audience. People cared, ideas mattered, painting mattered, movies mattered, poetry mattered. The way people judged and interpreted paintings, movies and poetry mattered. People believed in liberty and thought it really meant something. They believed in authenticity and thought it really meant something. They believed in democracy and with some blind spots in the common humanity of everyone on the planet. They had lived through a worldwide depression that lasted almost 10 years and a world war that lasted almost six. They were eager for a fresh start. And the reason I read that um, out to you was that um, a few months ago, I was asked to recommend a book on, on how to be creative. And this was the book I recommended, in fact, your book. And I read out that quote to them. Now, obviously, the conditions have changed. We haven't been through a world war. We haven't been through a depression. But what do you think the lessons are now for creativity and innovation today? It's a great question. And um, it, it's, I feel we're in a period of great uncertainty about the political future, certainly in my country, definitely. Um, when I finished the book, uh, which was in the spring of 2020, um, uh, and it was going into press, Biden was elected that fall. And I did feel suddenly there's a breathing space because the United States had really been through kind of a nightmare for five years uh, politically. And I felt this, this is an opportunity to turn the page and start again. And I, then I thought, well, the Germans called 1945 zero hour. In other words, that's, everything was going to begin all over again. They could forget about the past. Now, the Germans had good reasons to want to forget about the past, but like, everybody felt that way, as you suggested. The Depression, the war, suddenly it's over. And then there's peace and prosperity. This is a period of enormous economic growth all over the world, not just in the US or Western Europe, everywhere. Um, and so suddenly people could sort of sit back and say, well, let's think about what what's what's is noise music is throwing paint on a canvas a painting is a soup can a painting you know what should poetry be they could think about these things all as though they were just starting all over again that's a tremendous moment in cultural history when you could just sort of turn the page um and i think that so that was i think part of the inspiration for the creativity that you see in this period is feeling like we can we can start over again so now i feel of course that reality is sinking in and maybe you know the united states is still kind of on the knife edge of which way this country is going to go it's not at all clear that we actually have a breathing space but i felt that a little bit when i when i finished the book and i thought the book is helpful just so we can look back and see what people made of that opportunity after 1945 and see what, what we might made of that make of that opportunity now the big difference i think that you're implying by the passage that you read is that do we still care about what is art or what is music or what is cinema? Does that really matter to us anymore? Do, do, we, hear, do we want to have a critics explain to us what we should like and not like? I don't think we do. I think the cultural horizon is like limitless. There's just so much cultural product out there. We could never possibly even, you know, get to know a fraction of it. You know, probably like you, when I have dinner party with people, all we talk about is which which series we're watching on television, and everybody names series I've never heard of. I mean, there's so much stuff in the music world is tremendous, it's, and it's all global. But there are no monuments. Do you know what I mean? There's no kind of things that everybody's concerned to talk about. It's just like it's all cool. Yeah, you, know, you can like you can like it all. 
Um, so that's probably a good thing in certain lots of ways, but it's very different from this period when everything seemed to matter. Well, thank you very much. As I mentioned uh, at the start, there's, this is a really important book for the period you write about, but also the period today and what we can learn and how we can help promote creativity in the future. If you'd like to get a copy of The Free World, uh, Art and Thought in the Cold War, there'll be a link on our website to our partners at Waterstones where you can get a copy. Um, do check our website. We've launched around 60 new events now for our autumn programme. Um, some are online, uh, but also some are now live. We're moving back to live events where we can and, and do book into those events. Um, most of all, thanks for watching. And most of all, Luke, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Enjoy the book. <laughs>